Let the Lord of Chaos Rule. Book 6 of the Wheel of Time is the final book before the infamous slog, but unlike the previous five books, this one starts to show signs of slowing down. Things do happen for most of the book, but it meanders a lot more. Until the climax when everything goes to hell, but we'll get to that later. Also, small note, I'm going to be less spoiler light from here on out. I'm going to trust that if you've made it this far, you're in it for the long haul, so I will be discussing more detailed spoilers in order to fully explain my thoughts on the book. Starting off, Rand has made a pretty drastic move saying he's going to protect men who can channel and essentially offer them a place for them to train. And even with a move that drastic, there's still a catch. He's put a false dragon, that being Mazram Taim in charge. And it's for the purpose of creating weapons of war. And it's basically a giant middle finger to the White Tower. A massive shift in the status quo, one of the biggest we've seen so far. Men who can channel are very powerful, usually more so than women, but women have their own advantages to balance that out, such as the ability to link with one another. Factor in the decline in number of recruits and power of said recruits coming to the White Tower, and this is huge in potentially disastrous ways for the world in general. Rand is becoming more and more unhinged with each book, and while he's still acting with the best of intentions, and maintaining some self-control, it makes him much more of a loose cannon. Something that the Black Tower, which is what the men who can channel call themselves when they come together, kinda is as well. Especially with how shifty Tyene keeps acting, despite Rand trying to keep him on a short leash. But we can only wait and see what all this leads to. Meanwhile, the White Tower is still split with the main faction under Elida, the first Amarlin seat to be raised from the Red Aja in a good long while, and the Rebels, which is who Nynaeve and Elaine are with, that have many of their tower friends and acquaintances, including the depowered Swan Sanche and her former Keeper. And the Aes Sedai all treat them like shit. The Aes Sedai arrogance is on full display here, and it's infuriating, particularly for Nynaeve, even when she makes fools out of the Aes Sedai by doing the impossible, or tries to move the plot along. She's met with tons of resistance since the sitters look down at basically everyone else. Thankfully, they're challenged when Egwene shows up. Speaking of which, Egwene finally returns from her journey with the Aeel, having learned quite a lot, but the sitters choose to make her their Amarlin seat as a counter to Elida. They expect Egwene to be an easy-to-manipulate puppet for them, but our girl proves she's much more strong-willed than the Aja sitters expected, no doubt in part thanks to her time with the Aeel. And when Matt shows up, having built quite the army for himself, she sends him on a side quest with Nynaeve and Elaine despite the resistance that he puts up, but we'll get to that in the next book. This really shows growth on her part, probably one of her biggest flexes in the entire series. And it's satisfying as hell, in part due to how frustrating the Aes Sedai have been until this point. Moving back to Rand, he's dealing with Elida's faction that's trying to sway him, and continuing to demand respect from him. But he keeps outmaneuvering them and or overpowering them. The Rebels send some emissaries as well as Min, but their efforts are mostly fruitless as well. Politics take up a lot more of this book than the previous ones, and unfortunately the book kind of meanders on them for a while. Yeah, when I said this book meanders a bit, this is what I was referring to, and you'll probably zone out at least a little until something interesting happens. The politics in this series as a whole aren't bad, but in this book, they're not the best. Now this would make Lord of Chaos easily the worst book we've covered thus far in the series, if it weren't for the climax, and I'm going to give a much bigger spoiler warning here. So, Perrin finally returns, taking a bunch of his forces with him, sensing that Rand needs him. Rand does, as it turns out, but he dismisses Wolfboy at first, not knowing quite what that means yet. But then he gets captured by Elida's faction. Perrin rallies all the forces he can to go rescue him, but then a ton of other unexpected forces from multiple other sides show up. This begins the Battle of Dumai's Wells, and all hell breaks loose. Armies from half the fucking world, countless channelers tossing weaves all across the battlefield, and the heroes are trying to make sense of all this chaos and get to Rand. And that isn't even the end of the insanity. One final force enters the battlefield, that being the Ashaman, the men Taim was training. They devastate every other army in the battle, scaring them off. Even the fierce Aeol warriors allied with the Shido repositioning Rand as possibly the most powerful person in the world. 
and exactly what that means is still unclear. How much more devastation will he cause before saving the world? Only time will tell. Now the ranking. This book would be C tier without the Battle of Dumai's Wells. With it, and said battle resulting from all the buildup elsewhere in the book, it gets the A tier. Dumai's Wells is the biggest and best battle in the whole series, second only to Tarman Gaiden itself. Not just in sheer scale, but in the implications it has for the characters and the world. So it elevates the book a lot, though it's at the bottom of that tier for now. So what did you think of the book? Was there anything I forgot to mention? Whatever your thoughts, please comment them below. I'm Kieran Mythos, and I'll see you all next time.